Just one clarification on the on the gems uh, on the gems issue. Uh, gems is a is a ESNS product. Uh, it's the electric collection management system for um, for um, uh, ESNS voting machines. It's used in Georgia uh, in the in the um, current federal suit that Maryland marks and plaintiffs have against the Secretary of State. Secretary of State is fighting tooth and nail to prevent anyone with technical ability to look at the GEMS database. Uh, I'll have something to say about that in a, in a, uh, in a second, but, but everything Benny talked about, we're experiencing in Georgia right now. Um, so let me, uh, let me say, first of all, I, I was really happy um, to hear Barbara talk about voting rights, really happy to hear Benny lead off. Uh, about it. you can't live in Atlanta without being steeped in um, um, in civil rights movement and, and voting rights. So what I want to do is kind of talk, even though I, I'm using uh, it's a it's a big area in which two communities can come together. I forget who said that. Barbara said it. That, that two communities can come together uh, and make uh, make a bigger splash than uh, than either one alone. Um, so my colleague Carol Anderson wrote a book called One Person No Vote. Uh, uh, one of the really compelling um, sections of the book uh, goes through the history of voter suppression uh, from the 1890 Mississippi Constitutional Convention on. Uh, and the point that she makes uh, is that um, there was a plan, uh, and it's a hundred year plan uh, to, um, to suppress suppressed votes and, and we have certain characteristics, um, then it doesn't matter if you kind of overcorrect and also exclude people that you don't care about if they also have those characteristics. So for example, if you want to if you want to exclude black people in 1890s Mississippi, what you can do is exclude poor people. And and you kind of go through go through the characteristics that don't appear as if they have anything to do with race. And they come down to race. They come down to whatever characteristic you want to, um, you want to control. This, it turns out, is, is a very big deal because we've chosen to use computers to conduct collection. What this kind of voter suppression funnel looks like today, and it looks like stuff that we've been talking about. <clears throat> so, what is the 2019 funnel? It's these ten things. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them, but but I, I want to make I want to make some points. Um, that don't require you to do a deep dive into into Jeff's logic, into um, into malware, into the things that we're used to, to to talking about. So if you if you just sort of take a um, 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 you know a Tom Clancy view of, of the world, you, you've got people out there that have lots of resources at their disposal who can who can change the way that we conduct and report um, applications. Some of the other things that I'm gonna talk about, I think are less well understood, um, are less, less, um, uh, less talked about. Uh, they're in a lot of ways easier to, um, to understand. We tend to talk about item six. We tend to talk about the bugs and the hacks. Um, those are, 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 are technical issues. Uh, we can demonstrate them, we can, we can run, um, we can run our, our analysis tools to find out what's, what's there. Some of the other things are kind of um, so obvious that we don't we don't think about. So let me let me dispense with the technical stuff first. I, so despite the title of the of the talk, which is the same issue, uh, let me kind of dispense with 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 the with the technical part of this with just a couple of slides. The first um, uh, observation is that all of the modern voting machines are computers. Um, and the second observation is that all computers can be programmed to cheat, um, including the computers that we use for voting. And you're going to hear a lot about this for the next the next two days. Um, I think, I think the, the connection to, to the Mississippi plan um, is, is something that we don't think about when we think about computers. So if I wanted to steer people away from um, um, from voting. There was a group of people I wanted to people to get to the polling place, and that happens in Georgia. Um, we see polling places closed by the 
by the dozens. But even if you didn't do that, what I might do is require everyone to use an enormously expensive but unnecessary piece of equipment. And then, because this scarce resource can be allocated by the people running, running the elections, I can put that resource wherever I want. So I can put it in the, um, uh, in the top picture, which is North Fulton County, North Fulton County election, uh, election center. North Fulton County in Atlanta is a wealthy county, straight north. North Atlanta, so lots of wealthy stuff, maybe two dozen, three dozen voting machines. And this is the way it looks on a typical, on a typical election day. I've observed in North Pole. I, I know that even during the busiest hours, there are machines that are left empty. Um, sort of at the end of the day, people people come in and, and it fills up. But it doesn't look very much different than that, than that top picture. On the other hand, if I go a little farther west, uh, another suburb that happens to be predominantly black, predominantly predominantly lower middle middle class, what you see is the bottom picture. You see relatively few voting machines and long lines of people. This is the Mississippi plan. This is this. And if someone were to object, as happens in Fulton County, in Atlanta, if someone were to object about pallets of, of voting machines being unloaded in Roswell, Georgia, as opposed to South Atlanta. Well, it's a real easy thing to lose power courts. And that's what happens in Georgia. That, that you have voting machines that for six hours, eight hours, 10 hours of the, of the, the voting day can't be turned on because someone has forgotten the power courts. Here's something else that you get out of computers you get the ability to use your information about where people are when they're going to vote to, um, uh, to manipulate what happens in the 2018 Lieutenant Governor's race, which Sarah Miko lost by um, 130,000 votes, um, more or less. Um, there were places in the state in which, in which um, the results were so anomalous that it strains credibility to explain exactly what happened unless someone went in and switched up. So there, there was a, uh, a series of press reports a few weeks ago about a place called Winterville Station, Winterville the train station outside of Athens, uh, Athens, Georgia, predominantly Democratic precinct. Um, uh, I think the word nine machines in Winterville, Winterville Station. Um, all, uh, seven machines, I'm sorry. So, so six of the seven machines um, recorded um, on a statewide basis, uniformly by large margins, votes for Democratic candidates. Machine number three didn't. Machine number three. So machine number three was the statistical anomalous that had had you flipped the results, that is, had you had, you had um, um, uh, that machine vote Democratic and the others not, you would have had something that was very much in line with the, with the historical voting in that, um, in that, that precinct. So this chart, um, I think, uh, makes the point that, that if you have a dashboard, if you have the ability to target voting place by voting place, precinct by precinct, um, as the attackers almost certainly do, because these tools can be purchased for a song online, um, every, every takes their unpatched Windows 7 laptop to the local Starbucks, because that's the only place they can connect to the internet, is almost surely in a black hat database that is being used to target exactly what is on those, um, those, those computers. So this chart shows the, the, um, the undervote, the drop off in the vote for Lieutenant Governor. So the, the idea in Georgia, in any election actually, is that, is that people kind of lose interest as they go down the ballot. 
In this case, this, this is the, ele the, the election for, for governor. Um, the left hand, um, left hand um, mark is the, uh, uh, is the uh, uh, Stacey Abrams. Um, and then lots of people voted for public service commissioner and, uh, and dog catcher and, um, uh, and for, for judges. Um, but for some reason, for some reason, a large. I don't think it's a slide. I'm sorry? Lieutenant. So, so, so when it's later, it's not total. So, so, so this is, this is, this is the, the drop off for, for governor. Uh -huh. Lieutenant governor, secretary of state, agriculture, uh, attorney general, uh, and, 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 and public service, public service commission. So, so this black line, is the is the drop off from the people who turned their hand marked ballots in the place in the country shows it. You have a microphone, please. Microphone, please. What people do is they lose interest going going up. What they don't do is what's in the what's in the um, the orange line, uh, which is what happened when voting machines were were used. Mm -hmm. So when voting machines were used. Um, People who showed up at the polls to vote for the Democratic governor um, decided, for some reason, that they would vote for public service commission, but not the Democratic lieutenant governor. So a few things come to mind. Well, one, one is, well, why would you do that? Why, why, why wouldn't you just attack the um, um, the, the, the governor's race and and, um, and not worry about the lieutenant governor's race at all? And the answer is that, that whoever was responsible most likely had a dashboard. And in Georgia, winning the governorship without the lieutenant governorship is kind of an empty victory because the lieutenant governor controls the legislative agenda. So if you believe that Stacey Abrams was in a much, much tighter race with Brian Kemp than than you thought, and, and, and as the election went on, you found out that, that the margins were widening. You might put more of your resources into the lieutenant governor's race. So these two things had to have a had to have a team. Further, for example, a baseline increase in the voter ID where there were votes that were not passed. That's a, that's a great question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Please repeat that. Because the question. it's a paperless system. Okay. There's no way. Could go 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 where you want to go it turns out to be a very powerful concept, particularly if you have tools at your disposal that allow you to to to, to send you know some of your army here and some of your army army there, which which the attackers almost certainly do. With computers in the voting process, you have created a monstrosity from an IT point of view. These are machines that were never meant to talk to each other. Um, they have to be set up and reassembled by people who, who aren't particularly skilled um, skilled at it. Uh, and, and what you see in this picture uh, is the typical situation in the state where um, we're told that the machines are kept under lock and key in a chromatically sealed mayonnaise jar at some place. Um, you know, folks, this is Marilyn Marks and Logan Lamb and Matt Bernhardt um, uh, standing in an auditorium with some unattended building machines. And the poll workers have said, bye, we're going home. This is different. You might make up security measures that don't exist. So we're told, for example, that, that, that the machines are, are physically isolated from any communication network that could be used to send a signal, to download, to download malware, um, when it's palpably false. We know this because, well, election officials testified in a federal court that that's exactly what happened. Michael Barnes, the director, uh, the technical director of elections in the state of Georgia, um, admitted to Judge Totenberg that that um, uh, ESNS contractors were programming ballots on, on uncontrolled laptop machines from home. 
And then they would put those ballot definitions onto a thumb drive and hand carry them into the Secretary of State's office. At which point the Secretary of State, you'd think, would say, well, I don't know where those came from, but now I'm going to really take careful control of this, of this process. Now, now, once they get them, they have to infect um, a computer at any stage along the, uh, along the way. And, and thanks to Kim, is Kim here yet? Um, so thanks to Kim Zetters, um, uh, reporting and, 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 and others, uh, we, we know that this is the common Congress, that, that election officials assure us um, that there's almost no possibility that, that, that their machines can be connected to larger communications networks, when in fact they are connected all the time. Another thing that you might do is to create myths about the alternative. So the alternative, um, just to hammer the point home, the alternative is hand marked data balance. Yeah. So the alternative to computers is hand marked data, hand marked paper balance. You just kind of spring to life with these stories that you'd like to believe about the hand marked paper balance. They're easy to steal. That kind of blue shirt is not me, by the way. <laughs> One of those amazing coincidences. Uh, uh, I have never stolen a box full of paper balance. <laughs> Or, or they will tell you they will tell you that that, that amazing numbers of um, uh, of handmark paper ballots are like blizzard people ballots in Minnesota. That, that that people write crazy things on their ballots and you can't figure out what they uh, what they are. Neither of which is true. Neither of which is true. Um, so so one of the things that goes on here, personal observation, gets spun very quickly into a story. And the story of Georgia, which unfortunately has affected the rest of the country, infected the rest of the country, is that in the 2000 presidential election, there were 94,000 missing votes in Georgia. Because why? Because we used paper ballots. That's the story. That's the story that Kathy Rogers told to the EAC. That's the story that former Secretary of State Kathy Cox has been concocting in every local media um, uh, outlet. Um, and it's all based on a 2000 study that, amazingly enough, Kathy Cox go on. Uh, <laughs> were they undervoted in the 2000 presidential um, election? Almost none of which was due to the use of paper ballots. Um, it's, it's really hard to get a copy of this report, I will, I will tell you, but once you get a copy uh, of, the re of the report, you can just scan the data into a spreadsheet and take a look at what's, what's going on. The biggest source of undervotes in the 2000 election was what? It was punch card ballots, the hanging chat ballots, and malfunctioning lever machines. By a lot, 70%. 70% of the of the of the undervote was due to these these primitive ballot marking of, of ballots um, in which there were overvotes and undervotes that had to be discarded that were scanned hand marked paper ballots. But as Gabby Cox said in the 2000 report, the scanners, the deep old scanners, um, had an option to reject those ballots. So the Diebold scanners could have recognized overvotes and undervotes, rejected them, election workers could have spoiled the ballots and asked the voter to, to, to vote again. Why didn't that happen? Because the feature wasn't activated. And it wasn't activated on a very selective basis. Back to the issue of you put the voting machines where you want them to, to be. So you put you put the the, the capability to to reject improperly marked ballots where you want it, where you want it to be. And they have no idea. They have no idea what that what that was. Well, so that story, oh, hand marked paper ballots, hand counted, was a tiny, tiny fraction of the 2000, 2000 less than three percent. So the only thing we know for sure is that the bulk of the bulk of the uh, of the incorrectly marked ballots um, had nothing to do with hand marked paper ballots. It had everything to do with the way the system was administered. 
So that's how the myth gets 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 created. And this myth gets propagated today. I, you know, I'm I'm like many of you. I'm I'm watching in awe the uh, um, the Los Angeles County fiasco um, with 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 VSAP uh, using hand. It's based on the myth that there is something defective about hand marking a paper ballot that makes it a tool for public elections. Um, and then. Um, we come to to you know one of the real villains of this of this uh, of this story the, the idea that we're going to use a machine to mark a ballot um, because of all these other things that we were um, we were talking about. Um, Phil Stark, Andrew Pell, and I wrote a paper a few months ago where we went through the analysis uh, of why um, ballot marking devices cannot be relied on as a trustworthy way to record voters. Uh, voters choices. Um, there's no way uh, to prevent undetected discrepancies. There will be nothing that you would do about it. It's an argument that, that it's, it's interesting. It's, it has a technical technical basis. It's as far as I know an unrefuted argument. Lots of people are unhappy about it, but, but I, I haven't heard anyone, uh, anyone actually refute the, the points of the argument. But I will say this. I will say this. At the bottom of this idea that, that ballot marking devices are inherently insecure is another one of these myths. And it's the myth that's been with us from the days of BB, early days of BB Pat on. It's the idea that, that voters can verify a ballot. The myth of voter verification. So this is the barcodes, uh, it's got kind of these um, these inscrutable descriptions of what the voter presumably uh, presumably did, and the idea is is that the ballot marking device says this is what you voted, Mr. Or Ms. Voter. Um, can you verify that, please? And you're supposed to look at it and say yes, I voted that way. Or, no, can we do it? Can we do it again? And on the basis of that, on the basis of that, everything else follows. On the basis of the voter making an affirmative statement that this is an adequate representation of my, of my vote, you can conduct uh, uh, audits, you can conduct recounts, you can archive this stuff, that, that it's a complete myth that human beings will actually do this. The observation is, and it's presented, we, we talk about it in terms of current observation. I, I, there, there's research going back to 2002 that, that is basically the same result. Um, when, when you give someone an instruction, you give a voter an instruction to verify their ballot, half the time they simply won't do it. I'm busy, I don't know what you're talking about, I didn't hear what you said, I'm thinking about getting milk on the way home, the kids are crying, I'm just not gonna do it. So half of the time, voters simply don't look at the ballots. So those ballots can't be verified. And said, well, you folks have said you want to verify the ballot. Why aren't you doing it? Um, just doing that is a cognitively complex task. You can see the things that are involved. There are barcodes. So I have to look at this, at this ballot and say, what the hell is that series of bars doing? You know, that's not what I call it. I have, to, I have to kind of disambiguate what the parts of the, the ballot are. I have to parse the representation for my um, for my vote. Uh, I have to detect an error, not necessarily an error that I made, but an error that was made by the machine. Well, detecting an error is a ten times harder task than preventing the error to be human. So I've already kind of raised the bar for, for um, somewhere between half and eighty percent is what an experienced proofreader will detect. Half to eighty percent, but now we're requiring the whole burden for the the auditability of the ballots coming out of these these machines to be borne by people who have no training um, in, in doing. And and of course, of those who choose choose to look at all, uh, you know, they're going to spend so little time on each race um, that they're not going to be able to make a make a decision. Um, and and the observation is that. Half the time, 
they won't even recognize that when they see it. So, just to finish up, um, this. my day job, my day job is to investigate claims like that in educational psychology. So, I know a little bit about election security. I know a shitload about election security, about, about, about education. And I can tell you that that is not the way people behave. That is not the way people people learn. If you, if you tell someone, verify this, and I, I really, really want you, Garland, I really, really want you to verify this this, this ballot. Uh, this going to have virtually no effect on your, on your behavior. And, and if you carry out these experiments over a long period of time, you come up with this effect. It's called the two sigma effect. It's been known in educational psychology for almost 40, year, 40 years now. Regardless of what you do, when you tell someone something, their performance is going to follow this normal distribution, this bell shape, this bell shape curve. Now I can change that. I can change it substantially. I can change it by standard deviation, by um, um, by requiring them to repeat it over and over again until they get it right. I can move that 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 bell shape curve to a different shape by one standard deviation by doing that. Um, I can move it by another standard deviation. It's obviously not something that you can do to teach voters to verify to verify bells. So can voters be trained to be better verifiers? Maybe. Maybe there's some effect that I don't know about, that none of us know about, but, but it certainly is not obvious that that would be the case, that voters would, would do something like that. So, what's the sum total of all that? Sum total of all that is that ballot marking devices, for all those reasons, make, um, make meaningful audits impossible. You simply cannot conduct a risk limiting audit if you can't trust the audit, the, the audit trail that it's based on. You can't trust the audit trail because something like a quarter of the ballots are actually going to be verified. Think of it another way. Every unverified ballot can't be distinguished from, from what the voter cast at all. So you simply can't conduct an audit. We, leave, we come to the same conclusion that we started out with. That, that, that um, system can mark paper ballots. We're willing to use ballot marking devices for voters who can't mark a ballot. By, by hand um, is the simplest, safest, most effective system in the world. Thank you. Thank you. That was very impressive. And I want to go back to that chart because uh, you know, I found it very interesting that if I got understood what it was, that that top line was your vote by mail, hand marked paper ballots. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yes. And the other line below there was these GREs that didn't have any paper, and it totally violates the law of large numbers. Right. Well, well, so it's it's just I, 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 I think maybe Bill, I, I haven't seen the slides, but I have a fact. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a one in ten thousand chance that this could happen by by chance. Um, there had to be some other way for, for, for that effect to show up. So, so my question is, the express vote, it has, it's unique in that it has a barcode, but it's also unique in that it has two separate records of voter intent on one ballot. So I keep hearing this argument from elections officials where they say, well, if the barcode doesn't match the human readable part, we'll catch it in an audit. And my question is, okay, then what? Then what? Then what do you do? They could both be wrong. Have you, have you heard of any of <laughs> Have you heard of any official give a concrete plan of what they would do if that did, I don't think an election would be salvageable because the results would be so important. Because audit. <laughs> so so just saying the word audit, I think I think makes them makes them think it, it can happen. But but in in fact, you know, there's there's an equation. If you if you if you unroll the, 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 the loop that you use in a, in a risk limiting audit, there's an equation at the bottom of a loop. You can't mess with that equation. And, and, and assuming that something represents voter choice A when it actually represents voter choice B messes with the, with the equation. And, and even for risk limiting audits that go to a full hand recount, 
It's actually worse when you go to full hand recon because then you've got the whole universe of poisoned and unpoisoned ballots, and it will tell you an outcome that has a tenuous relationship with what the what the voter actually did. Could you um, talk a little bit about the, the next generation of voting systems? They are uh, they have more ability to talk to each other, um, but also the platform that they're about to be released on is a web set of platforms. Can you just inform? Uh, okay. Well, as we say, uh, the, the Dominion system is going to be based on Windows um, Windows 10. I actually don't know that that's um, that that's true, but but the current generation of systems is is always a work in progress, uh, and there's no reason to believe it's going to be in any more secure, stable platform than uh, the old DRA systems. I've had arguments with people who say that there are uh, DMD systems <coughs> don't have a barcode. In other words, you punch it on the screen, it prints it out, you get it through it on machine. But it still goes through a machine that is the end of our touch. My understanding is the risk of a change in that case. Well, so there, there are different flavors of these, of these machines. So one kind of machine, a hybrid machine, um, prints out the ballot for you to look at it, and then you feed it back into the machine, and then it goes through the printer again. Um, no telling what kind of mischief happens. happens. There are those machines should be out where the election security, as a cognitive science, is pretty clear about, about showing showing someone a ballot and saying, is this what you intended, is no guarantee that that's what they intended. But even if the cognitive science was somehow different, you could still tell the machine that you punched the votes in before it printed out. Uh, well, so on, so on some of the machines, yes, on some of the machines, that's certainly true. Okay. Yeah, try to be as quick as possible. Uh, we're running a bit on. Hi, uh, Rich, you had mentioned something about a black hat database. You said that all of the, I thought you were saying that election officials working on their laptops would be in a black hat database. Yep. And I was interested in that phrase and what exactly that implies. So, so the background of dashboard. So this is a company that sells dashboard information for hackers and, and CISOs and, and people who want to protect the system. But, but basically what it shows you is for whatever characteristic you want of machines that are currently attached to the network with an IP address, here is the software running on those machines, here are the users on those machines, here are the patterns, here's the patches that have been applied to those, to those machines. And, and this is literally data from hundreds of millions of hosts that are connected to the internet. And so someone who wanted to protect the system would know, I have to put my resources here because worldwide, this is where the next ransomware attack is going to come. If I were a ransomware attacker, I would say, this is where I need to put my resources in order to succeed because they're going to be looking over here for the next ransomware attack, and I know they're vulnerable over, over, over here. I mean, this is this is the this is the um, uh, the Star Wars game in in, in cyberspace. So this is this is how attackers and defenders are kind of at this at this balance point where they have the same information, they have the same research to uh, um, every one of those those unpatched laptops in the hands of a Wisconsin uh, election official that's connected to a Starbucks in rural Wisconsin. I guarantee you, was in this database. Uh, and, and, and an attacker who wanted to look at what was on those machines, how that machine was vulnerable, would know how to do that. Last, last question. Thanks for your presentation. Back to old school politics, 1974 in Ohio, Cleveland. State Representative Sweeney introduced me, the public health senior advisor, to democratic politics. His mother brought him in at 13 to come and mark paper ballots. She told him, if it's for them, and if I got it on an email and said, this is how I voted, that would be verification. But that old school system of politics is a problem. Yeah, so it, 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 it is, you're right. Uh, the chain of custody, having control of the, of the ballot box is really, really um, important. Um, but, but that, I think, is, is an issue that we, can, that we can deal with. So because we know, we know, um, what would happen to the votes once they went into this locked box? We put more resources on protecting protecting those those boxes. We know a lot more than putting it into cyberspace where we have no no guarantees at all. Thank you.